David and Julia Sokol, who both work for Christian Friends of Israel, were given custodianship of a unique and poignant collection of photographs of the notorious Auschwitz death camp. They were passed on by Ron Emanuel, a CFI supporter. To help ensure these horrors are never forgotten, she had encouraged a professional photographer called John Guy from Liverpool to compile an exhibition of images he had taken at the camp. John was born in 1960 to a Christian family although the family subsequently traced back Jewish heritage. His grandmother had been called Lindemann and had emigrated from Germany and disembarked in Liverpool. Photography became John's passion. We were unable to trace John or his family, but this collection of images selected from over 80 frames is too important not to be used to educate on the horrors of the Holocaust and the evils that raged during the Nazi persecution. Giving John full credit for this work, which he called Echoes of Sorrow, we endeavour to ensure his legacy continues. We hope you can sense today in some way the tension, the sorrow, the fear, loss and poignancy, as you see the truth of what took place, whilst often the world and humanity seem to look the other way. Nazi persecution rises during the 1930s, particularly of the Jewish people of Europe. World War II is declared in 1939 and will eventually involve the vast majority of the world's countries. Auschwitz, built near the Polish town of Oświęcim, will become the biggest and most deadly of the six dedicated extermination camps. In April 1940, the foundations and walls of Auschwitz are constructed by stripe-suited laborers, building their own prison. Rudolf Hess, deputy Führer to Adolf Hitler, inspects the site and comments that it was ideal for incarcerating the rapidly growing numbers of prisoners, mainly Poles. By the 20th of May 1940, six camps are functioning. The first gassing of Jews begins in February 1942. By the middle of the year, equipment to sterilise 1,000 Jewish women is installed. The majority of Europe's Jews lived in Poland and Eastern Europe, but Jews around the world are alarmed and try to flee for safety. By September 1942, British Home Secretary Herbert Morrison opposes any further admission of Jewish immigrants into Britain. He feared it would encourage the French Vichy government to dump Jewish children into Britain. Hitler declares publicly that the war will result in the destruction of European Jewry and by October 15 trains arrive at Auschwitz full of deported Jews from Holland, Norway Belgium and Slovakia. Persecution of Jews continue to rise and 1942 
becomes known in history as the most catastrophic year of the Holocaust. Here we see the sign which greeted every person who passed through the Auschwitz gates. It translates as, work will set you free. It's not known exactly how many will perish from neglect, overwork and sadistic torture overall, but Auschwitz sees the highest percentage of all the camps within the Reich. This image shows the barbed wire fencing around the buildings and perimeter. It was labeled between life and death by John Guy in the original files. It portrays the security and permanency of what the Nazis built into the camps. On 6th of February, 1943, a marathon roll call forces inmates to stand motionless in snow without food for over 13 hours. Many will die on their feet and those unable to make it back to barracks at the end of the day are sent to the gas chambers. Life is harsh in every way, but many cling to their faith and hold out in hope for a miracle. Even those who line up before the gas chambers still held that faith above all things and prayed the words of the Shema their most sacred prayer. It says, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Elchenu Adonai Echad, which translated in English is Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and it's taken from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Some of the Jewish victims gave up, but amazingly a group of Jews in the camp resist an attempt to blow up the crematoria three. Rudolf Hess says later in 1946, I declare herewith under oath that in the years 1941 to 1943, during my tenure of Auschwitz concentration camp, two million Jews were put to death by gassing and about half a million by other means. Historians will eventually conclude that the number of victims there was between 1.1 million and 1.6 million. In July 1944, SS General Richard Bayer becomes Auschwitz's new commandant and 46,000 Jewish inmates are gassed and cremated there. By early September, 1,019 Jews from Westerbrook on the 18th of September, 1944, 1,400 Jewish boys at Auschwitz are taken from their barracks to the children's block and gassed. A week later, it's Yom Kippur, the most holy day of the year for Jews. 1,000 young boys are picked out by Dr. Joseph Mengele, who uses many Jews in his medical experiments. Two days later, he kills all those he deemed as too short in height. Still to this day in Auschwitz Museum, there are sketches depicting his horrific work. By 20th October 1944, Nazi administrators at Auschwitz burned documents referring to prisoners and their fates. Equipment is also destroyed but the death factory is too large to cover up. Incredibly, holding onto their faith and dignity, on 11th December 1944, Jewish slave labor quietly celebrate Hanukkah in Auschwitz III. The Nazi machine rages on Mengel continues his vile medical experiments. These numbers and actions alone aren't easy to imagine. The scale is too horrific, but these represent real people 
who have been made pawns in Hitler's pursuit of cultural supremacy for his Nazi party and his so-called acceleration of a pure German race. These men from the camp are a stark reminder of the preciousness of life, stripped of hope and humanity, respect and dignity and of a future. How can we fathom the scale of the destruction of lives? What sort of mind and ideology does it take to produce such a killing culture? In January of 1945, four Jewish women are hung in Auschwitz for attempting to smuggle explosives into the camp in October the year before. Between the end of January and March of 1945, acting on orders, the SS start a huge on-foot evacuation of prisoners and slave labourers from Auschwitz and the other camps. Of the thousands who were forced to march, most died from exposure, exhaustion and abuse. On the 17th of January 1945, the Red Army enters Warsaw, Poland, a journey through the country, hardly knowing what they might expect to see. The final roll call at Auschwitz II camp alone is 11,102 Jews, 10,381 women and 10,030 in the main camp. Liberators, battle-hardened soldiers find carnage so shocking words fail them. Many are haunted by what they see for the rest of their lives and many never speak of the magnitude of evil seen at the camps. As the Red Army troops stand amongst the tens of thousands of pairs of shoes taken from victims at the camps, they are horrified. Photographers who were present at liberation are stunned as the children of the camp show them their tattoos etched into their arms. Lives scarred in so many ways. Astonishingly, there was life after Auschwitz. One survivor says, we lost and yet we won. We are going on. Many survivors since stress how important it has been for them to make their lives worthwhile and to retain hope and their precious faith. Communal living meant harsh and demeaning facilities with a complete lack of privacy or dignity by design. Prisoners often experienced times of great humiliation by some of the guards. Auschwitz will become a huge slave labour camp as well as killing centre. Factories like that of Farben are given tax exemptions to build in the camps, exploiting victims and growing the German economy and regime. Under supervision of SS physicians like Dr. Josef Mengele, particularly those aged between 18 and 40 are singled out for extermination through work. They are shaved, tattooed with a number degrading their humanity and registered. They are inadequately clothed, starved with meagre rations, deprived of sleep, made ill with insufficient and deficient sanitation, exhausted by labour, demoralised and tortured. Those who failed this selection for slave labour are stripped of clothes and valuables, heads shaved and gassed, but not before gold fillings are extracted. Nothing is wasted and over the coming decades evidence will be found of the huge amounts of booty taken by the Nazis. These people aren't just a number. They are husbands, wives, brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, aunties, friends and colleagues. Communities, academics, professionals and families are all affected. In the late 1990s, details are exposed, proving that the German Deutsche Bank gave lines of credit 
to help finance the construction at Auschwitz. The use of slave labour in German industry through the years of Nazi Germany is still being discovered. But in 1944, we know that of 750,000 concentration camp inmates, half were Jewish slaves for German companies. Suitcases and shoes are still seen at the camp by visitors today and serve as a reminder to all who see them. The victims of this pervading hatred had no idea of their impending doom. They had hurriedly packed precious belongings in suitcases, were told to write their names on them and boarded trains, thinking they would be relocated somewhere else in Eastern Europe. But as they disembark from those trains, possessions are separated from people and belongings are sorted, and these become yet another part of the profitable endeavour of the Nazis. Mountains of shoes from victims form and are collected as economically as possible. The footwear is kept in storerooms called Efektan Kamen literally storehouses or storerooms of movables. Lives, old and young, end up in the camps, stripped of so much more than shoes. Women are made to sort these mountains of shoes at Auschwitz, adding to their humiliation. Reports tell us that they were dwarfed by the size of the pile of shoes. The upper part of the shoes are removed from the soles and leather from rubber and the material is sent to Germany. Pick out a particular pair of sandals or boots. Imagine who they might have belonged to. What might their story have been? How far had they travelled before entering the infamous gates at Auschwitz? Each pair represents a life loved by family and friends. A life holding the potential of dreams that could have been fulfilled. Imagine Jewish families visiting the camp decades later, even today. Those shoes may have been a grandma or distant relative. Can we even imagine the horrors these people faced? In the late 20th and early 21st century, David and Julia Sokal, through their work with Christian Friends of Israel around the nations, have been privileged to visit many survivors of the Holocaust, both in the United Kingdom and in Israel. These precious people who have seen and survived so much continue to show amazing resilience and strength of character. Some have felt guilty throughout their lives for surviving while so many others perished. Many acknowledge their faith and Jewish heritage as it lives on in them, in their children and their grandchildren. Many show their ingenuity and tenacity and bring blessing to the nations through technology, literature, science and humanitarian work around the globe. They feel blessed to have lived long lives. Those now living in Israel are so grateful to be in the Jewish homeland promised to their forefathers in the Bible, despite their earlier years. On visits to the homes of survivors, we hear all of them plead, let the world know, tell them our story, don't let anyone forget. Those of us who hear these stories become witnesses through photographs and testimonies, actual visits, exhibitions and commemorations of the Holocaust. This awful stain on humanity. These stories must continue to be told. We must strive to grasp and remember every life is precious. And we must learn from history and never forget. We 
Never shall I forget the horror of it all. Little faces of children turned into wreaths of smoke. Never shall I forget those flames beneath the clear blue sky, consuming my friends, my faith, my God, my dreams to dust. But why? Six million Jews in gas chambers are murdered by starvation and a world stood by through indifference a world that watched in silence i survived to see someone stare at me from the depths of a mirror i stood a corpse gazed back was it really me barely alive yet free but what is freedom if memories are always trapped with flames. I left the camp, but it not me. Nothing can erase the pain. No, never, never shall I forget the horror of it all. To see my inheritance bereft, to stand, to suffer, to fall. No, never shall I forget.